Good morning, guys. Greetings in the name of Jesus Christ. How are you all doing? I'm filming from the road our little trip I told you about. Well, last minute, we're going. So we are on the highway right now. So I'm going to keep this short and sweet. We're out in the middle of nowhere, which is great, but we're in a little ball of traffic uh, out here on the roads. So uh, hopefully it'll be a nice, safe trip. And uh, I appreciate in advance any prayers for travel mercies that you guys offer. Uh, usually these trips go real good. The Lord always watches out for us. But you know what? Any extra prayers just uh, go go along with making it that much better. <laughs> so I thank you guys in advance. Uh, this morning we're going to be reading out of Psalm 52, 8, the mercy of God. Now, this is an interesting psalm. And there's a side note to this. So let me read it first and then I'll tell you what the side note is. Something I, a conclusion I came to a while back, and I haven't done a video on it recently, but I might. Uh, the whole verse says, But I am like a green olive tree in the house of God. I trust in the mercy of God forever and ever. The thing about the green olive tree, it's a, it's a, it's a tree bearing fruit because the olives are called fruit on there. Um, another interesting side note to this before we read the uh, context is that I did a study into the two witnesses a couple of years ago. And I'm not the only one that sees this. This is uh, several other very well-known theologians. When they read about the two witnesses, they don't come away with it's two individual people, but two groups of people because there's a specific reference to them. And this would be a great avenue of study if you want to take it on. It says, these are my two olive trees. The, the Jews are the cultivated olive tree. Us Gentiles are the wild olive tree. And there's a bunch of verses that talk about this. And when I looked at that, I got to thinking, you know what? This makes more sense that it's not just two people, but two groups of people. Because they're going to be affecting the whole world. Well, how are two people from Jerusalem going to affect the entire world? And whenever it says, you know, they left their bodies laying in the street, why would they leave two bodies? Why wouldn't they just bury them? Maybe because it's, it's bodies all around the earth. And there's so many of them that it was just too big of a task. So they were like, forget these guys. We're just going to leave them out there. I don't know. I'm just throwing it out there. But it's a great avenue of study when you look into the, the referencing used to describe the two witnesses. And it kind of seems like it's describing something else from what everybody else has accepted is um, is the real, you know, real meaning of that. So the context will go up a few here. We just start verse one. The steadfast love, steadfast love of God endures. To the chief musician, a contemplation of David, when Doug, the or Doeg, the Edomite, went and told Saul and said to him, David has gone to the house of Ahimelech. Why do you boast in evil? So he gave context to the context. Why do you boast in evil, O mighty man? The goodness of God endures continually. Your tongue devises destruction like a sharp razor working deceitfully. You love evil more than good, lying rather than speaking righteousness, Selah. You love all devouring words, you deceitful tongue. God shall likewise destroy you forever. He shall take you away, pluck you out of your dwelling place, and uproot you from the land of the living, Selah. The righteous also shall see and fear, and shall laugh at him, saying, Here is the man who did not make God his strength, but trusted in the abundance of his riches and strengthened himself in his wickedness. But I am like the green olive tree in the house of God. I trust in the mercy of God forever and ever. I will praise you forever because you have done done it. And in the presence of your saints, I will wait on your name for it is good. And I think today we're all doing that. Meditate a little on this mercy of the Lord. It is tender mercy with, with gentle loving touch. Or it is tender mercy with gentle loving touch. He healeth the broken in heart, and bindeth up their wounds. He is as gracious in the manner of his mercy as in the matter of it. It is great mercy. There is nothing little in God. His mercy is like himself. It is infinite. You cannot measure it. His mercy is so great that it forgives great sins to great sinners. After great lengths of time, and then gives great favors and great privileges and raises us up to great enjoyments in the great heaven of the great God. It's a whole lot of greats there. It is undeserved mercy, as indeed all true mercy must be. For deserved mercy is only a misnomer for justice. 
there was no right on the sinner's part to the kind consideration of the Most High. So when God gave us salvation, it wasn't due to our merits. So basically, when we ask the question, um, I got something in my eye. Get out of there. When we ask the question, why me, Lord? The, the answer is, it's not about you. Because we didn't deserve it. He just decided, I'm going to give this to this one. I'm going to offer it to everybody. But this one in particular, I'm calling this one. This one over here, I have a job for this one. It's nothing about us particularly. It's about God. It's about the love of God and how he seeks to save his creation instead of let it be destroyed. There was no right on the sinner's part to the kind consideration of the Most High. Had the rebel been doomed at once to eternal fire, he would have richly merited the doom. And if delivered from wrath, sovereign love alone has found a cause. For there was none in the sinner himself. It is rich mercy. There's nothing about us that makes us worthy of anything. Nothing. Which makes what he did that much more valuable and that much more powerful in that something that we didn't deserve and definitely you know had no merits towards was given freely i, I it, the only way it could have come out like that is it could have it, it had to be that there was a great separation us being as far away as we could be in our in our doom and him being as far away as he could be in his love to make this act that much more powerful and that much more important it had to be that way. We couldn't be halfway through. We had to be all the way away from him. He had to be all the way the other way from us. So that the distance coming together was so great that when we finally met in Jesus, it we don't want to leave. It, it, is a, it was such an arduous trip, such an arduous journey to get to that point. And here's what the kicker of it is. is we didn't make any of that trip towards him. He made the whole trip to us. Jesus came down from heaven and was born in flesh and dwelt among men. He made the whole trip himself. We didn't make any of the trip. That's why the only step we ever have to make is just to turn around. One step to him, that's it. Uh, let's see if I can find my place. It is rich mercy. Some things are great, but have a little efficacy in them. But this mercy is a cordial to your drooping spirits a golden ointment to your bleeding wounds, a heavenly bandage to your broken bones, a royal chariot for your weary feet, a bosom of love for your trembling heart. It is a manifold mercy. As Bunyan says, all the flowers in God's garden are double. There is no single mercy. You may think you have but one mercy, but you shall find it to be a whole cluster of mercies. And you have to excuse me, we're bouncing around a little bit trying to hold the phone steady. It is abounding mercy. Millions have received it. Yet far from it being, it's being exhausted. It is as fresh, as full, and as free as ever. It is unfailing mercy. It will never leave thee. If mercy be thy friend, mercy will be with thee in temptation to keep thee from yielding, with thee in trouble to prevent thee from sinking, with thee living to be the light and life of thy countenance, and with thee dying to be the joy of thy soul when earthly comfort is ebbing fast. One of the great things about what we have in Christ is that no matter what happens in this life, he's always there. And these things lead us through, carry us through, strengthen us through, comfort us through all the trials of life. And when we come to the end of that life at our appointed time to go, it's there comforting us and reminding us, you know what's on the other side. You're going to this place instead. And it makes... I mean, there's so many amazing stories out there of people talking about, you know, when, when a real Christian would die in a hospital room, they would walk in and it, they had a sense there was a lot of people in there, or the room was brighter right before they died. You know, there's weird stories out there. I did a video on it a while back. Um, just really weird stories of, of the amazing things people saw and amazing things that they saw on the other, on the other end of the scale, somebody who wasn't near God, somebody who wasn't in Christ, and the terrible things they saw. Nurses, you know, commenting, I don't want to ever see a atheist or a non-believer die again because it's so horrible to witness. So, the, the wonderful thing is that 
no matter what's happening, no matter where we are, no matter what's going on, no matter what troubles you're having to deal with, this mercy is there always. And as you walk through life, as you grow in grace, as you become built up as a believer, are we in uh, Blanco? Really? Oh, okay, Maynard. Um, these things carry us through, these things comfort us, and these things uh, escort us across the threshold into, into heaven. It's an amazing thing because we get so hyper-focused going the other direction, looking at other things in life, and forget that we have these gifts as Christians. We forget that we have these access to these wonderful blessings. And so we end up not taking full effect of them. But when we are more focused on what he's doing, more focused on what he's doing. That's why you got to read the Bible every day and, and study it because you have that constant reminder of those things. When we're reminded of those things, when we are always have those things up in the fresh in our mind and in the forefront of our, of our mind, <clears throat> fresh grace, fresh mercy every day. It makes all that the way we walk and the way we respond to those things so much different than what the rest of the world does. The rest of the world responds with arrogance and hatred and anger, frustration. But as we grow, how do we turn? How do we end up responding? We're, we're kind of stoic in a way to some of these things, to the point of maybe even seeming like we were indifferent. But it's just we already know where it's headed. We already know what's going to happen. We already know how we're going to come out on the other side. And we don't. It doesn't ever. We don't ever get comfortable in that. Uh, to the point that we take it for granted. But we're, we take comfort in it, knowing that this is going to be the result every single time because we're in God. This mercy is is an amazing thing, and, and we don't talk about it enough. A lot of preachers just they just don't talk about it enough. The mercy of God and what He has done, and, and how you know even whenever we don't realize it, He's still there showing us mercy. I mean, He shows the unbeliever mercy. It rains on the just and the unjust at the same time. You know, this age of grace isn't just for us; it's for everybody that dwells on the earth. I mean, look at how many of those people are rich. I mean, how many of them have great lives? Look at how many of them have wonderful things. But at the end of the day, when, when everything is finished, the deciding factor is going to be who acknowledged that mercy, who lived in that mercy, who willingly and gladly took part in that mercy of God instead of just taking it for granted and just assuming that it had everything to do with them instead. Like this talks about, you know, you, the, the, the psalm said lift yourself up. You trust in your riches. That doesn't do you any good. The mercy of God gave you all those things. You should have been praising him and giving thanks to him. Well, instead, they they think it's it's about them that they didn't, they didn't do it. And so what the mercy of God does for us is it brings glory. What the mercy of God does for them is it brings justice. Because since they don't, they don't want to acknowledge God at all, and they know the truth, it's right there in front of them, they just don't want to acknowledge it, that justice comes from. It's a twofold mercy of God. And, and like I said, we don't talk about this enough. We don't address this enough. We don't get into this enough. Everybody receives mercy, but that mercy looks very different depending on what side of this you're standing on. For some, it's justice. For some, it's glory. So for all of us that are believers, it'll be glory. The mercy of God shows glory. It shows tri a triumphal entry into heaven as the sons of God which we are being changed into. I still got something in my eye. I cannot get it out for what it is. <sighs> Father, we come before you this morning in the name of Jesus Christ to give you praise, honor, and glory, and to lift you up and to sing praises under your holy name. Father, thank you for this holy word and thank you for this devotion. It is an amazing thing for us to come to a place where we start to grasp, even on a small scale, your mercy and how it works. I love this devotion because it talks about something we rarely talk about. The twofold mercy that you show us all. In this age of grace, everybody gets a chance to, to take part in your mercy. Everybody gets a chance to take part in your grace. And the word confirms it. The, the Bible confirms it. You show these things to everybody. But when the time comes for all this to change, for all this to come to an end, that mercy still shows through. For those who don't believe, it's justice. For those that do believe, it's glory. It's, it's an uplifting. And that we go through everyday life, we still enjoy these mercies. And 
a lot of people may not see it that way. They look at us, look at your terrible life, look what you did wrong. Look at what you did wrong. You know, you must have done something wrong to make God mad at you, and that's not the case. It turns out those of us that are living on the lo lower end are doing better because we're even more in your mercy. Paul talks about in the, the thorn in his flesh, and he said, Jesus told him, my grace is sufficient. His mercy was sufficient for him to cover him. And remember, it's not our mercy, it's his mercy. It's not our faith, it's his faith. It's not our grace, it's his grace. And we are partakers of all those things. And because it's all about him and nothing about us, the gift is full and the the, the relief, the, the change, the comfort, the, the help is all full. When you make it about you, you take some of that away and because you're trying to do it by your efforts. And we know our efforts don't do anything for us. When it's all about him, we, you look at the world differently. We look, we, we consider things differently and we become we come to a place where we're in more in gratitude towards you for the things that you've done for us, the amazing things that you do every day that we scarcely consider and scarcely even know. One of the other Psalms says, I can't even count back to you. I can't even recount to you your blessings every day. We thank you for your mercy. Just like we do when we end every prayer, we thank you for your mercy. Because without your mercy, we would have nothing. We would be nowhere. We couldn't possibly have a chance or be saved. So we thank you for this twofold mercy that is given to everybody, to all men. And that we're thankful that we're on the right side of it. And pray that we continue to walk on the right side of it and that you keep us on the right side of it. Thank you, Father, for your mercy and grace. Thank you for your great love, for your free gift of salvation. In Jesus' name, we bless you, praise you, honor you, and glorify you. And in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we pray, amen. Guys, thank you for joining me for Morning Devotion. If, if you're struggling with things, if you're having issues, if life has got some stuff that's bugging you or is, is getting to you, stress, depression, welcome to the club. We're all going through that stuff. I mean, look at the world today and the way it is. Most of us are being treated badly by the people that we know and the people that are around us. It's a, it's a terrible state today. But even though those things are happening, even though we may be struggling, even with the, just the bare essentials, food, clothing, a place to live, because we believe we have this mercy that leads to glory that God is showering us with, and sometimes it may not look like it. Sometimes we may not be able to perceive or comprehend that it's his mercy that's carrying us through these things. But I can tell you something, it's a whole lot better, and the Bible confirms this, to walk through life struggling. You know, with many, it's many trials, we, we shall enter heaven. With much, much trouble, we shall enter heaven, as the scriptures say. It's better to walk through life struggling and fully lay on the mercy of God and have that triumphal entry into heaven than to have everything handed to you, have nothing to worry about and no troubles in life and never once look to the mercy of God, even though you're still getting it, even though it's still being showered upon you. Jesus made a great statement. It is really hard for a rich man to enter heaven. It's easier to, to put a camel through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter heaven. But why is that? Because the rich man looks to himself. The rich man doesn't look to the mercy of God. Some do, not, not all, because they're self-made men. They, they feel like, I did this. They're, they're going towards their own efforts instead of looking to God and his mercy for that. That twofold mercy for some glory, for some justice. If we look away from God, if we make it about us, we've made a mistake. So instead, let's turn around. Let's be glad we have the life that we have. Be thankful that we, we have what we have and look towards the mercy of God in all things because that is what's going to get us through. That is what's going to get us to the end. That's when it's what's going to see us in, to the other side. It's his mercy. It's him. I love you all very much. I bless you all in Jesus' name. I'm going to do my best to keep up with these. Uh, they may be uh, the way when I upload them. You know, I just have to do it when I can. So they may be... Uh, <clears throat> not at the normal time, like uh, even devotion at six, but I'm going to do my best to get them uploaded at some point in the morning and in the evening. And uh, 
I'll be posting some pictures on the community tab of uh, where we're going. I love you all very much. I bless you all in Jesus' name, and I'll see you.